People often ask the question, what is salvation? This is a very important question because it deals with what happens when a person dies, but his soul continues to live. You may also ask exactly what is my soul and what happens to it after I die? We're going to address those and other important questions in our lesson. Good morning, my name is Earl Garner. I teach a senior adult Sunday school class here at First Baptist Church Bonifay. I'm so glad that you could join us. Our lesson is found in the book of Romans, chapter 10, verses 5 through 15. It's going to focus on Paul's uh, concern for the salvation of his people, the Jews, who rejected Jesus, the Messiah, when he came to earth. But first, let's address the question of salvation, your soul, and what happens to it when you die. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it says that when God created man, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. Our soul will never die. The soul may be defined as a person's essential self, or the spiritual, emotional, rational, and intellectual and immortal part of man. We'll call that person uh, essential self. The real you. The real you will continue to live even though the body dies. At the end of the age when Jesus returns, every person who is alive or who has ever lived will have their soul reunited with their new body, one that will last for all eternity. This will take place at the events of the rapture and the resurrection. In the meantime, what happens to the real you after your body dies is strictly up to you. It's your choice. So you may ask, what are my choices? Well, you actually have only two. Your first, first choice is to do nothing. Every human being, except for Jesus, of course, is a sinner and is separated from a holy God. This means that unless that relationship is repaired, you will live eternally separated from God in a place of utter darkness. Jesus called that place hell, a place of torment, and fire and brimstone. The Bible describes those who die and have never confessed Christ as Savior to be on his left side at the judgment seat. Matthew chapter 25 verse 41 says, Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and the angels. Now, hell was never created for human beings. It was created for Satan and his angels who rebelled against God in heaven in the very beginning. Jesus said in Matthew chapter, 20, chapter 10, verse 28, Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul. If you select the first choice, you would choose the wrong one. Your second choice is so much better. It is to live eternally with Christ in heaven as a child of God. And the Bible describes these people as being on his right hand at the judgment seat. This is a different judgment seat. The Bible calls it the Bema seat, the seat where Christ will reward all the believers for the works they've done on earth, how they've lived their Christian life. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 34, Jesus said, then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed to, of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Paul, in quoting the great prophet Isaiah, Isaiah describes heaven in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, as a place made of things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered into the heart of man all that God has prepared for those who love him. Someone has said that if we knew how glorious, how joyful and wonderful and fulfilling heaven really was, that we would want to go there immediately. The Bible gives us just enough information to cause us to wait for uh, that time while we recognize that we have a great purpose, a ministry here on earth to reach the lost. Need I tell you that the second choice is the right one? 
Does anyone know who will and will not be saved? Well, no one except God, because one of God's attributes is that he is omniscient. That is, he has infinite knowledge of all things that can be known. To put it another way, he is all-knowing, and that includes knowledge of the past, the present, and the future. Therefore, only God knows who will and will not be saved. The Bible calls those who are or will be saved as the elect. That's where we get the doctrine of election from. This does not mean his knowing dictates who will be saved, but only that he knows who will freely choose to accept his gift of salvation. So to put our lesson in context, let's look briefly at verses 1 through 4. Verse 1 says, Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. Paul is referring in this verse to his Jewish brethren and his desire for them to be saved. He did not see any contradiction between the doctrine of election and prayer or the doctrine of election and evangelism because he did both. He prayed for the lost, not knowing who would accept the uh, salvation that he prayed for, or for evangelism because he didn't know who would accept the message that he presented. The truth of God being omniscient will enable us to understand how much the Bible has to say about salvation. While God knows who will accept the gospel message, we do not. We are commanded by Christ to share the gospel with everyone. Salvation is the very purpose of the gospel message. Matthew chapter 28 verse 19 is a command from Jesus to all his disciples to preach the gospel to all nations. You'll recall that he said in John 3, 16, that whosoever believes in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And in the very next verse, verse 17, he says, God sent his son into the world, not to condemn it, but that the world through him might be saved. This is really, really good news. Except, of course, for those who do not believe, not everyone is going to accept the love that God offers. Verses 2 and 3 says, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. The Jews had rejected Jesus and continued to pursue their own righteousness through the law. They missed the gift of God's righteousness and continued to rely on their own works instead of the works of Christ. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 9, that he wanted to gain Christ not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Human effort, no matter how sincere, can ever substitute for the righteousness God offers us by faith. We can only hold out our empty hands and receive salvation as a gift from God. The works that we do, no matter how good they are, are seen as just dirty rags before a holy God. Verse 4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. When Christ came, he put an end to the law by fulfilling everything that it required, every jot and tittle. Jesus established a new covenant which was made effective upon his death, and he became the guarantee and the mediator of a better covenant. A covenant is like a last will and testament. The maker has to die before it becomes effective. And so when Jesus died on the cross, his covenant became effective. And you may ask, why could the law not save a person? It was not meant to save people. The Mosaic law was to lead men to Christ. Paul said in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, Therefore the law was our schoolmaster, of course our tutor, to bring an, us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. As we move into our focal verses of the lesson, we begin in verse 5. It says, For my, Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. If any righteousness could be obtained in the law, it would be your own righteousness, not God's righteousness. If he, it could never measure up to his. 
Paul said that the law was to show people how guilty they are. The law was not given to defeat sin. It was given to define sin. The law was a law to live by. And when man sinned and broke that law, he was required to confess it, to make a sacrifice to the Lord for a temporary covering of that sin. Even the high priest had to receive forgiveness as he took the blood of an innocent slain lamb into the Holy of Holies and sprinkled it on the ark. He prayed for the sins of Israel to be forgiven. And he had to do this year after year after year because it's a temporary covering. Verses 6 and 7 of chapter 10 says, But the righteousness based on faith speaks thus, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend to heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead? Now this is one of the most beautiful passages in the Bible because it pray, portrays Christ as our righteousness. We don't have to bring him up from or down from heaven or bring him up from the grave in order to obtain his righteousness. Christ has provided our salvation through his incarnation when he came to earth and his resurrection when he came back from the dead. In verses 8 through 10, it says, But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. You do not have to go on a journey to find Christ. He is as near to you as is your heart and your mouth. All that you have to do is reach out and receive him by faith. This great plan of salvation that God came up with was in his mind before the creation of the world. It has been a golden thread woven through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, yet it comes to man in the simplest form. Believe, confess, and receive the matchless gift of eternal life. In verses 11 through 13, it says, For the scripture says, Whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Paul had to go back over 2,700 years in the Old Testament to, to the Jewish prophets Isaiah and Joel to make this point in these, these verses. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16 is quoted as saying, Whoever believes on him, that is, believes on Jesus the Messiah, will not be put to shame. He then follows up with Joel chapter 2, verse 32, that says, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Notice that Isaiah dealt with the heart, the faith, the belief that you have to have, and Joel dealt with confession, that is, with the mouth to receive salvation. Paul writes in Romans chapter 3, verses 21 and 22, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. Righteousness refers to three things. It refers to God's character, refers to the gift that is given to everyone who receives Christ, that is, salvation. And thirdly, the standards of right living, the type of living that the Bible teaches that Christians should live by as, a, as Christians on this earth. These verses link our justification before God to God's righteous servant, Jesus. It does not matter who you are where you're from, what nationality you are, or what you have done in this life. The gift of salvation and eternal life is available to you from a loving, holy God. You receive it simply by believing on His Son, Jesus Christ, repenting of your sin, and confessing Him as your Lord and Savior. In our last two verses, verses 14 and 15, it says, How then shall they call upon Him in whom they have not believed, and how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? 
just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. Paul makes it crystal clear the path to be followed in evangelizing the world. The first point is, in order for an unbeliever to call upon the name of the Lord, he has to be told about him. Secondly, that means there must be someone who is willing to go and preach the gospel to him. And thirdly, to be sent by God to proclaim the gospel message requires that person to be a follower of Christ. This then is the responsibility of of every believer because every believer is called to go and preach the gospel. Well, you may say, wait a minute, we pay a preacher to do the preaching. I know, my friend, you too are commanded by Jesus to preach the gospel as well. He said to his followers, all of his disciples, in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You may say, well, I preach the gospel by the way I live my life. I'm a good guy. I go to church. I tithe. I go to a Sunday school class. I I coach a Little League baseball team. I'm a good provider, a good family man. So that's the way I preach the gospel. Well, modeling the Christian life is important, but we need to connect the mind of the unbeliever to the message of the gospel. Both lifestyle evangelism and confrontational evangelism should be used together to promote the gospel. We must take God's great message of salvation to others so that they can respond to the good news. How will, you, how will your loved ones and your neighbors hear about it unless you tell them? If you're a believer, I want you to think of someone you love and someone you know that is an unbeliever and make them an object of prayer. Ask God to give you the courage and the conviction to share the Christ who saved you with them. You have a personal salvation story if you're a believer. And this story you should tell uh, is unique to you and no one knows it better than you. Go and tell them what Christ has done for you. Remember, Paul said in verse 15, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things, that is the gospel, to the unbeliever. I want to urge you this morning to take your responsibility as a believer very seriously and share your story with someone who needs it. If you're not a believer, I pray that you will take this opportunity to trust Christ as your Savior and be saved. Don't put it off. Don't wait a while. Do it now. And Father, we thank you for this time together, for this study in Romans, and we Pray for those who've joined us this morning and ask that it bless them. And we thank you for your word. In Christ's name, amen.